So you guys ready to hear the Word of God today? Are you ready to walk in freedom? Are you ready to be just lifted up a little bit to a higher place in your life? All right, well then say this after me. My mind is open. My heart is ready. Make me free in you, God. In Jesus' name. You know, when you look at history, and you look at culture, and you kind of look at the world around you, you'll see that in every culture, in every society, in every people group, there's a story somewhere about freedom. Every people group in history, you'll find that they have been subdued and dominated by others, and they have longed and fought for freedom in their lives. It's a narrative that kind of runs through all of history. Kind of everywhere you go around the globe, you find people looking for freedom. In every culture, every society, I think from the beginning of time, we've been looking to be free. Throughout the course of history, we see the fight for freedom from tyranny over and over again. And it seems as soon as people get into freedom and get relaxed, somebody else rises up and begins to try and dominate as people groups seek to subject each other to their own will and dominion and people seek to be free from one another. Whether it's one nation against another nation or one corporation against another corporation, fighting for freedom within their own political system, fighting for freedom within others, we see that fight for freedom all around the world. And you know, it's interesting, the price of freedom is always the same, isn't it? We find the price that's been paid for freedom and over and over again is the lives of people willing to sacrifice. There's always someone out there who would take your freedom away. And there always needs to be someone who will rise up and give their life for the freedom of others. Willing to give their lives so their families and their children can be free. We see it in every generation. We see it in every society. I think the world has always been that way. And it will probably always be that way. You know, it seems like just when you think peace is kind of coming to the earth and things are getting better for a few years, something else rises up and causes turmoil and strife. And we find people fighting for freedom once again. Well, I believe, and this is point number one, I believe that cry for freedom is something that God has placed in our hearts. I believe that cry for freedom runs across all of humanity. It runs in every society. It runs in every culture around the world because it's something that God placed inside of us to desire freedom. And I believe this with all my heart. You were created for freedom. You were not created to be held in bondage by anything or anyone. You were created to be free. You know, even in the freest of countries, in the greatest of democracies, and I thank God for democracy, I am so thankful that we live in a country where we can boot our government out if they start acting like idiots. You know what I'm saying? That's a good, good thing. They start making crazy laws and start putting their thumb down too heavy on the people, and the people can just go out with you, in with the new. That's a good thing. Democracy is a wonderful thing. We have a fantastic police force that we can actually trust. When's the last time you got pulled over by the police and you worried about what they were going to bribe you for or what they were going to try to take from you or what they were going to try and do to you? I mean, unless you're doing something illegal, you know, the worst you're going to get is a fine for driving a little too fast most times, right? I mean, we really don't worry. And sometimes you even talk your way out of that just by being nice. I always try that. I always try to just be as nice as I can possibly be to that police officer and hope for mercy, right? Last time I got pulled over for speeding, I had a little chat about real estate and gave him some advice on the sale of his home and drove away a happy camper. Amen? I'm so glad that we live in a free country with a great police force, a justice system that, you know, by and large, serves justice well. We live in a country with a government that's a democracy that we can vote in and vote out. But you know what? Even in the freest of countries, even in the best of political systems and in the best of legal systems, people find themselves unable to enjoy that freedom. Isn't that true? Because we find the freedom that we really need is something that has to happen on the inside of us. Even in a great democracy, we find people who are bound by fear. 
We find people whose lives are dominated by worry. We find people who have given in to the, that evil thing of greed that drives them and controls them. We find people who will destroy their families chasing after just one more success in business, right? We find torment. We find guilt. We find condemnation. We find incest. We find addiction. We find negative habits of every kind that destroy. We find people living in a country where everybody has the opportunity to do well and to prosper. We find them living in poverty on the streets. We find failure of every kind going on. We find people living with low self-esteem and and lack of self-control and all kinds of things that dominate and control and subdue and hold people down. And you know what? Even in a free country, many people are anything but free. Because freedom is not just an external circumstance or situation. It's an internal condition of the heart to be free. And the reality is, as we go through life, we experience and develop hurts. We develop habits. We develop hang-ups. And some of these things are just the product of life in a broken world. It's just the way it is. My grandpa, you know, not my grandpa, I'm just saying, an example. (laughs) My grandpa was a wonderful guy, but, you know, just grandpa you know, abused his son physically and was domineering and hateful and angry and had a bad relationship. And the son now abuses his son and is domineering and angry. And then that son, and the pattern goes on, doesn't it? Dad and mom were alcoholics. Kids become alcoholics. Their kids become alcoholics. The patterns persist. One child grows up in a home where there's sexual abuse and they grow up to become an abuser one day. These are real things that happen. Real curses that come into our lives that that control us and dominate us and really limit us and hold us back from reaching the full potential and all that God wants us to be. There's so many things that come into all of our lives that, that can create bondage and can create negativity. It could be a broken relationship. A young girl meets a guy and puts her heart and her hopes in that relationship with him and he shatters those hopes. And she finds herself going from relationship to relationship, trying to keep the guy interested, trying to keep him happy, trying to keep him involved, trying to keep him and his attention and affection towards her. She's not free. She's broken by what happened in the past. It could be loss of a job and suddenly our confidence goes way down because we had all our hopes pinned on that job. Low self-esteem sets in and pretty soon we're struggling to get by. It could be rejection. Fears can develop from the things that we go through. Anxiety grows. Habits and addictions form as people search for pleasure and happiness. How many people just begin pouring their lives into things looking for pleasure and happiness and these things begin to dominate and control them? It happens. So we have to consciously work to live in and produce freedom in our lives. We've got to do some things to stay free. Because life by its very nature will begin to subdue and dominate and control you. That's the world we live in. I'm not painting a very nice picture here, am I? <laughs> the world is a wonderful place. I still believe that. But freedom can be taken from us by so many things. We've got to understand that. The Scripture, the Word of God promises us something else. It promises us something better. It promises us freedom that can begin on the inside and work its way to the outside of our lives and we can live in and walk in freedom. Amen? Number two, you are free in Christ. When you are free in Christ, you are free indeed. You can live in a free nation and not be free. You can even grow up in a great family and not be free. You can be bound by so many things in your heart. This is again the Scripture we read earlier in the service from John 8, verse 34-36. to 36. Jesus answered them and said, Most surely I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. He's saying that once 
Christ comes into your life and makes you free, nothing can take that freedom away from you. It's a freedom that you can continue to walk in and live in all the days of your life. Jesus promises us freedom that can be taken by no man. A freedom that exists within regardless of the external circumstances in our lives. A freedom that grows and develops as we follow Him. The more we surrender our lives to Him, the more free we become. Amen? Number three, for every blessing, there's a battle to claim it and there's a battle to keep it. We talked for all the last two months about the good things that God has for us and just, just looking for favor and looking for good things and being people who are positive and seeing the good and looking for the good. But you know what? The other side of that reality is for every good thing that God wants to give you, you're going to have to fight some battles in faith to walk and to keep that good thing, to keep that blessing. If you want a better family, you've got to fight for it. You want better grades in school? You've got to fight for them. You want to be free in your finances, free from debt? Guess what? You've got to fight for it. You want better relationships that are healthy and whole and strong? You've got to fight spiritually to keep those relationships and to walk in those relationships. You want to be free from bad habits? Guess what? You've got to fight for that freedom from bad habits. You want to be successful or in your career or in your business? Guess what? You've got to fight for it. You want to be free from fears and anxieties and grief and sorrow? Guess what? You have to fight for it. You want to be free from the habits and the hang-ups that are negative, that would control you and dominate you and subdue you and push you down. Guess what? You've got to fight for that freedom. You can accept circumstances and choose to live under them, or you can choose to overcome and live above them. Amen? You've got to fight the good fight of faith. You can accept that inner turmoil, those struggles, those negative thought patterns, those things that control you and dominate you on the inside, or you can seek to be free in Christ and fight for that freedom. As you grow in Christ, your spirit grows stronger and you become undaunted and unstoppable in your faith. But we've got to fight. We have to fight on the natural level. We have to fight in our thinking. We have to fight on the spiritual level. We have to fight the good fight of faith. Amen? Last month we talked all about the good things, that God has a life of blessing and favor for us filled with good things. This month we're going to learn how to fight for those things. How to walk in the freedom that produces good things over and over again in our lives. Amen? Because reality is the world's a hard place. It's a beautiful place. The world is full of beauty. There are wonderful, amazing people that you get to meet and know in the world. But you know what? The world's also a hard place. There are also people who will chew you up and spit you out. you got to know that, right? you got to know that the world is going to be beautiful, but it's also going to be difficult. And we've got to learn how to fight the good fight of faith in order to walk in the freedom that God has for us so that we can experience all the good things that He has for us every day of our lives, not being held in bondage by anything, but free to experience all God has for us. Romans 12.21 challenges us, do not be overcome by evil. There's evil in the world. It's going to happen. Evil things will happen happen to you don't be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good you want to be free in your personal life guess what you've got to fight for it you cannot let evil overcome you when somebody does you wrong you got a choice you can become bitter or you can forgive and become smarter and better isn't that right somebody does you harm you can choose to not forgive you can choose to become bound up and tied up with bitterness on the inside. Or you can choose to walk in forgiveness and allow God to bring freedom to you on the inside. The vices, the habits, the sin, the negative patterns, the things that would destroy you can be overcome. The feelings of fear, inadequacy, even self-loathing, guilt, anxiety, depression, hopelessness, all of these things can be overcome come i remember when when uh, my son was little not this one my other son 
We had a couple nice Tiffany lamps, you know. And he broke one of them. And we came home and talked to him about it. And first he said it was aliens. Then he said it was the cat. He tried to blame the cat. And then finally he said, I couldn't help it. Satan made me do it. It wasn't, wasn't my fault. I, I, I did it, but it was the devil that made me do it. And I couldn't help myself. Sometimes we kind of act that way. You know, we say, well, I just couldn't help myself as we go and do that thing one more time that we shouldn't be doing. Right? I just I couldn't help myself. It was too strong. It was too hard. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I was watching a, a movie the other day with my wife and this mom and her son, they end up homeless on the street and they're hungry and they've got no food. And finally she gets to the point where she's like, we've got to eat. And she takes her son into the grocery store and has him watch while she steals a couple sub sandwiches, you know those sandwiches that are wrapped up, and she sticks them under her coat. And then she hurries out of the store. She gets out of the store, and she's walking across the road, and she stops. She says, you know what? We're not this kind of people. We can't do this. And she goes back, and she takes those two sandwiches and puts them on a grocery cart by the door and walks away. You know, you always have a choice. You always have a choice what kind of person you are. Amen? Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Number four, your faith is the key to your victory. If you want to walk in the freedom that Christ has for you, you've got to learn how to fight the good fight of faith. You've got to learn how to stand in faith, how to receive by faith, and how to walk in faith over top of above the circumstances and the things that would hold you down. What is faith? Faith is simply the simplest definition I can come up with for faith is confidence in God. It's trusting Him in spite of what you see. Everything can look negative. Everything can look bad. But you choose to be confident in God in His goodness. Faith is confidence in God. I really believe it's a conviction that somehow God will see me through. Amen? We can get all mixed up and all kind of turned around about how faith is and how to, how to walk in faith and how to, be, how to believe. But really, when you boil it all down, it's simply being confident in God, knowing that He'll move on our behalf if I just keep trusting Him. Trusting Him when it seems to make no sense at all to trust Him, but you keep on trusting. Amen? Hebrews 11, chapter 1 is the great verse on faith. And I love the Scripture and what it says. It says, faith is confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. Faith can look crazy. You know, you can look like a mad person refusing to give up, refusing to give in, refusing to accept the circumstances, refusing to accept that the odds are against you, refusing to accept that the cards are stacked against you. It can look crazy, but it's a deep-seated confidence in God that what you hope for, God will actually do in your life. And it gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Your life might look exactly the opposite, but you choose to believe in God. Amen? New King James Version translates that Scripture just a little bit differently. Instead of saying faith is confidence that what we hope for will happen, it says faith is the substance of what we hope for. That word substance is the word hypostasis in the Greek language. And it can be translated confidence, it can be translated assurance, and it can be translated substance. If you look in the Greek language, hypostasis means a thing put under something else to hold it. Like a foundation or a substructure that goes underneath something. Underneath this stage, there are joists that are holding me up. I can't see them, but I know that Joe and Roger put them there. And I know that they laid the plywood on top and they laid the floor on top of that. And I can stand on this platform all day long and there is a substructure underneath that platform holding me up in the air. That's what faith is. Faith is a substructure it has actual existence. 
You can't see it. You can't touch it. It isn't a physical thing that you can touch, but it is a real thing that has substance and existence. Another way that we can translate that word hypostasis is the substantial quality of a person or a thing. Faith becomes a substantial an undergirding foundational substructure, a substantial quality of who you are. Your faith becomes unshakable. Faith gives substance to the promises of God in your life. You haven't got that promise yet, but you've got faith, which is just as good as that promise. And it'll get you that promise eventually faith hangs on and holds on and refuses to give in until the answer is manifest that's what faith is people with faith act differently they walk differently they talk differently they behave differently they take risks that other people wouldn't take they speak differently about things people with faith have a substance and a strength about them a confidence about them that's unshakable. A confidence, a boldness, a positiveness that comes to your life when you learn to walk in faith in God, fighting the good fight of faith, not giving in, not yielding, not surrendering. You know, you may have battled those negative thoughts in your mind for years, but you refuse to give up. You keep trusting God for freedom in your life. You may have been battling guilt or depression for years, but you refuse to give up. You keep trusting God. You keep believing. You keep working on it. You keep fighting in faith. Amen? Number five. The biggest battle for your freedom doesn't happen out there. It isn't fought with swords or with machinery or with weapons. The biggest battle for freedom is fought right here. Right in between your ears. It's your thought life. It's your soul realm. It's where everything in your life begins. Everything in your life starts in your soul and comes out. Jesus said these words. He said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. How do good things come to you when you get your soul, your mind, your thoughts, your emotions working in a healthy, positive way? You build up good treasure in your soul you'll produce good things in your life. I think we could say by extension that a negative man, out of the negative treasure in his heart, brings forth negative things. Isn't that right? We have negative treasure stored up inside of us. We're going to produce negative results in our life. So we're created body, soul, and spirit. Right? When you look at me, you see my body. You see a man who needs more hair with some wrinkles forming here. It's the result of too many children. I'm sure if I could go back and reduce the number of children, I'd have more hair. (laughs) And less gray hair. You see my body. You interact with my soul, don't you? You hear my thoughts, we talk, we share ideas, we do things together, we laugh, we have fun, right? So you see my body, you interact with my soul, but there's another part of me that very few of you ever get to see. That's my spirit. That's the real me. That's the hurts, the fears, the longings, the hopes, the dreams, the aspirations, all of that stuff that motivates and drives and makes me who I am. That's the real me. And guys, we can hide our spirit from a lot of people. Isn't that right? We can go through life with all kinds of shells and all kinds of faces and all kinds of fronts and put on all kinds of exteriors for people to see. And we can talk about all kinds of things, but how many of us ever really share what's happening to the real me? Very few of us ever do. Even with our spouses. Isn't that true? It's really hard sometimes. That's the spirit. So we're body, we're soul, and we're spirit. We're made up of these three different parts. When you come to Christ, when you receive salvation, 
When you receive His life in you, His Holy Spirit fills you on the inside. It's called the new birth. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he can't enter the kingdom of heaven. So that new birth is your spirit being transformed and changed. And we've all, maybe some of us like me, grew up in the church really you know, walking with God from a young age, but others of us lived until maybe even into our 20s or 30s until we came to know Christ. Those of us who have that story can tell you the incredible change that happens when you come to Christ and your life just gets revolutionized from the inside out. I remember I had one friend in the days when I was logging and uh, he had come to Christ in his 30s and he was a logger. You know what I'm talking about? Like just a tough, rough, working man, foul mouth, foul language, all that stuff, you know, working out in the bush with the guys. And his wife got him to go to church one day and he went and he came to Christ. He accepted Jesus as his Savior. He repented for his sin. And about a week later on the job, one of the guys looked at him at lunchtime and says, man, what's wrong with you? He's like, what are you talking about? He says, like, you haven't told a dirty joke or swore like all week. Like, like, you're different. Like, what's going on? And he's like, oh, I never even thought about it. He hadn't thought to himself, now, I've accepted Christ into my life. I better not use that kind of language or I better not tell those jokes anymore. Something on the inside of him changed. And his soul, his thinking, just changed. Why? Because his spirit changed and it affected his soul. The Bible says that the righteousness of God comes to live inside of us. That His Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us. That our spirit is recreated at the new birth. And that recreation can automatically create immediate and great change in the life of a new believer. We hear people say things like, you know, after I came to Christ, I couldn't believe how beautiful the world was. It was like I was walking around in a daze and I couldn't even see. The sun was brighter. The grass was greener. The birds sang more beautifully. Like everything was different in my life. Why? Because something came alive on the inside of them and it created immediate and great change in all different parts of their life. As your spirit takes on God's nature and His righteousness, it changes you. So right away, you're better than you've ever been. And you guys that came to Christ later in your life, you know what I'm talking about. You're just suddenly better than you've ever been. Your spirit has been made new. And you know the difference right away. Now when it comes to your body, sadly, many of you will be like me and you'll lose your hair. It'll turn gray. Some of you will shave it off on purpose. I don't understand why. If I had hair, I would let it grow. I'm just saying. But your body's going to get wrinkled, it's going to get old, and eventually you're going to die. Even though your spirit's been recreated with the life of God inside of you, your body's going to get old and die. Not yet, Dad. you got a few more good years in you. But it's going to happen, isn't it? Why? Because your body is going to be saved in heaven. The Bible talks about an eternal body that never decays, that never gets old, that never gets sick, that never dies. So your spirit is transformed when you come to Christ. Your body is going to wait until you die and you're living here right in the middle of that. And you've got this thing called your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. Now some of that stuff begins to change right away when you come to Christ because your spirit just affects all these different parts of your life. But guess what? The reality is your soul is being saved while you live. You've got to transform your mind. You've got to renew your thinking. You've got to change the old habits, the old negative habits. Guess what? After you come to Christ, you've still got those old thought patterns. Those old ways of dealing with people. Those old habits all oftentimes stick around. That's where the struggle for freedom happens. It's up here in your head. That's why you can meet a Christian who sincerely loves God and yet lives with all kinds of bondage and darkness and negativity in their life. It's kind of like an oxymoron, right? Like postal service. There's no such thing as postal service, right? A negative believer. Like, how could you be a believer and 
be negative. It's like being a believer and an unbeliever at the same time. Like, how does that happen? How do you have the life of God in you and live with bondage and negativity at the same time? Because that's what's happening. And we see many people who in their Christian life settle to allow all kinds of bondage and darkness. They're anything but free in their life. They're so bound up. And yet they love God. And they're saved. Their spirit saved and reborn and recreated. Their body will be saved one day in eternity, but they have not worked to set their soul free. They have not worked on their mind, their will, and their emotions. That's why the Bible says on one hand, we're saved by grace. For you are saved by grace through faith. Not of yourselves. Nothing you can do about it. It's a gift of God, right? And then on the other hand, the same guy who wrote that verse says, now listen here. You better work hard and work out your salvation. Get to work. On one hand, he says, you know what? You're saved by grace through faith, not of works. And on the other hand, he says, get to work and get at it and do something with it. Right? It's a free gift from God. So get to work. Let's look at those two scriptures. They seem so opposing. Ephesians 2, verse 8 and 9, written by the great apostle, the apostle Paul. For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast about it. You're going to heaven one day, not because of anything you've done, but simply because Jesus died for your sin and He chose to rescue you out of your darkness. You're saved by grace through faith. Grace comes to you and you respond believing in grace and you're saved. But then Paul, the same apostle, writes in the book of Philippians to a different church. He says, now listen, you Philippians. Boy, oh boy, you Philippians. Listen up. Work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obey God with deep reverence and fear, for it's God working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases Him. But guess what? He'll give you the desire to do it. He'll give you the ability and the power to do it, but then you've got to do it. You've got to choose to grow in it. You've got to choose to work at it. So, we're saved by grace, not by works, Nothing we could do to earn it. Nothing we could do to deserve it. It's a free gift. We just receive it. But now that we got it, we got to work at it. it your spirit is saved. Your body's going to be saved. But you're living here right now with a soul that isn't. You've got to transform it and renew it and work out your salvation in that soul realm of your life. Does that make sense? So here, is where you fight the battles. In your soul, your mind, your will, emotions is where you're going to win or where you're going to lose. It's where you're going to grow and increase in freedom or it's where you're going to go and regress back into bondage again. Here is where you move forward or backward and you've got to battle for it. You've got to work at it. You've got to have some discipline. You've got to have some self-control. You've got to have some determination to walk in the freedom God has for you. It's up to you to get the Word of God in and retrain your brain for freedom. It's up to you to identify old negative thought patterns, old negative habits of speech that are not from God. It's up to you to determine what you're going to think about because what you think about will ultimately manifest in your life. You can't think the wrong thoughts and live the right life. You gotta retrain your thinking. If you're full of negativity, eventually you're gonna produce negative things. If you're full of jealousy or envy, eventually that's what you're gonna produce. If you're fantasizing about sinful things or, or fantasizing about lustful thoughts and dwelling on them, guess what? You're gonna produce those things in your life. If you fantasize and imagine all the things that can go wrong, guess what? You're gonna live with anxiety and fear. You've got to retrain your mind to God's Word. James chapter 1 says, temptation comes from our own desires. It's up here. Which entice us and drag us away. 
These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. And Mark chapter 7, from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They all come out of your soul. These are what defile you. So the battle for your freedom has more to do with what you allow on the inside. What kind of thoughts do you allow to roam around inside your head? Than anything else. Learn to recognize thoughts that don't please God. Learn to recognize thoughts that are not according to His Word. Thoughts that are negative. Thoughts that are destructive. Thoughts that are lustful or prideful or thoughts that will produce negative evil things. Identify those thoughts and then begin to deal with them. Determine that your brain will be a positive place. A place that honors God. A place that honors others. A place reserved for whatever is good. Take responsibility for what's going on between your ears. We're closed with Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true, what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is admirable. You know, only you can choose the thoughts in your mind. Nobody else can dictate that area of your life. I can't dictate to you how you're going to think. Only you can make that choice. Fix your thoughts on the right things. And then keep putting into practice. Or sorry, think about things that are excellent. Think about things that are worthy of praise. And keep putting into practice all you've learned and received. And then the God of peace will be with you. You were created to live a life that's positive, strong and free so keep moving on keep moving forward keep putting into practice keep improving keep getting better keep fixing your thoughts on things that are good fixing your thoughts on the word of god on his promises on his righteousness on his truth and don't give up don't give in don't surrender make freedom and strength your goal amen strong overwhelming freedom in your life strong overwhelming faith in your heart faith that sustains you faith that conquers you for you faith that brings freedom and blessing of god into your world amen